Good evening and welcome to the Explorers Club Monday evening lecture. So glad to have everyone joining virtually. Uh, our topic, the, uh, the event tonight is Ancient Entrepreneurs, How the Canaanites and Phoenicians Sailed West and Created the Mediterranean Trading Economy. We have with us a special guest, Professor David Schloen from the University of Chicago. Uh, I'd like to introduce him, very happy to have him with us. Um, he is a foremost expert in his field in archaeology. Uh, he has about 30 years of experience conducting ex excavations, starting in Ashkelon, uh, Turkey, and Israel, and other places around the Mediterranean. Uh, he is a professor of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. And we're very happy to have him. In part, I have a personal connection. I was able to visit his dig at Tel Quezon back in 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, with my son. Uh, who is going to be hopefully uh, participating as a volunteer this summer in August uh, as well with him. Uh, we also, uh, in addition to welcoming uh, Explorers Club members uh, who are dialing in, we also welcome alumni from the University of, Ch of Chicago, particularly my alma mater, the Booth School of Business. Uh, we're particularly excited to learn about the origins of the trading economy, how credit was uh, started, uh, how it was all written down in some uh, respect. And uh, that angle is particularly interesting to me uh, as, I, as I learn more about it tonight myself as well. Um, I will turn it over to Professor David Schloen, who uh, will provide his lecture for tonight, uh, 40, 45 minutes, and then we will open it up to questions and answers. Uh, if you would uh, put your questions into Facebook or YouTube and we will collect them and I will ask uh, David directly uh, through the live stream. So with that, I would like to welcome David Schloen to the podium. Thank you, Andrew. And it's really great to see you, Andrew, although even by Zoom. Um, we've been trying for a couple of years now to get together in person and it'll happen someday. And I look forward to visiting New York uh, at some time uh, in the future. I'm gonna share my screen uh, so you can see my PowerPoint slides and then uh, give you my talk for the evening. Let's see. All right, I think everyone can see that probably. Yep. Good. <clears throat> well, as Andrew said, I have been a professor of archeology span at the University of Chicago uh, for 26 years now. And before that I was involved in excavations um, as a graduate student. Um, I've been running archeological digs in Turkey and in Israel uh, for quite a few years with a focus on the culture and history of the pre-classical Levant, um, the area along the Eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean, you know, uh, everything from Turkey to Western Syria, Lebanon, Israel, um, that whole coastline. Uh, I am very glad to have the opportunity to uh, today to tell you about the research I've been doing in the past few years as I've shift, shifted my focus to uh, Phoenicians and to maritime exchange. And at the end of the talk today, I'll be telling you about an exciting new project, uh, not in Turkey or Israel, but in Spain that I'm uh, pursuing with Spanish colleagues at the University of Malaga uh, to excavate uh, an almost 3000 year old town or the ruins thereof on the beautiful south coast of Spain, um, the Costa del Sol. So as you can tell from my topic uh, today, my current research is focusing on the culture and society of the Phoenicians. This is an ancient group of people who are known to us indirectly from the Bible and from classical Greek sources. And ironically, even though the Phoenicians were the ones who perfected the alphabet and quite literally taught the Israelites and the Greeks how to read and write, very few of their own writings have been preserved because they were inscribed not on clay tablets, but on perishable organic materials like papyrus that have long since disintegrated in the humid climate of the coastal Phoenician cities with no chance of preservation as in the dry desert climate of Egypt and with no one to copy and recopy their vast literary output in subsequent centuries as was the case with the ancient Hebrew and Greek writings that we have at our disposal today. So despite the enormous cultural impact of the Phoenicians in their own time, most of what we know about them is inferred indirectly from the gravitational pull they exerted on their Mediterranean neighbors. And it is, uh, 
and what we know about them is from the perspective of their neighbors and rivals, especially the Israelites and Greeks, who either who perhaps did not fully understand them and who were often actively hostile to them. But we do know enough from Greek and Hebrew sources to say that the Phoenicians were famous in antiquity as seafaring merchants who accumulated great wealth. And archeological excavations have shown that they were intrepid explorers who left their homeland in what is today Lebanon and Northern Israel and sailed throughout the Mediterranean, establishing colonies in Cyprus, Sicily, Malta, Sardinia, North Africa, and Spain. Uh, I'm probably leaving out a few places. Uh, in the green areas shown on the map in this slide, the main area of Western Phoenician colonization. We now know that their colonies in the Western Mediterranean predated by quite some time uh, and also set the pattern for later Greek colonization efforts. In the top left of this slide, you can see an ancient uh, relief sculpture showing an Iron Age uh, Phoenician uh, sailing vessel, single masted simple sailing vessel. And in the bottom left, there is a photo of a modern replica of a Phoenician ship, which sailed in 2020 from the Mediterranean Sea and across the Atlantic all the way to Florida, proving that these simple vessels could undertake long voyages. Ex uh, Explorers Club member Yuri Sanada was involved in this expedition and as I understand it, gave a presentation about it to the club, which is available on YouTube. I look forward to talking to Yuri some more about what he's learned from uh, this, making the replica and sailing it uh, across the ocean. But uh, <clears throat> who were the Phoenicians? Let me advance my slide here. Uh, let's see. I'm having a little technical problem, so just give me a second as I figure this out. Sorry, off to a bad start with somehow frozen this thing. I'll stop share and start it up again in just a moment. Okay, let me do that over again. Okay, I think we're back here and there we go. I hope you can see the second slide now. Yep, you're all set. Good. But who were the Phoenicians? The simplest answer is that they were the Iron Age descendants of a subset of Bronze Age Canaanites who occupied the central part of the eastern shore of the Mediterranean in what is today Lebanon, Northern Israel, and a little bit of Western Syria. The Bronze Age is the name given by archeologists to a cultural period that lasted in this region for more than 2000 years from about 3500 BC until 1200 BC or maybe 1130 BC according to some scholars. Um, and we'll talk about that, that, that later date. The, the Bronze Age is often thought to end at 1130 because that's the time of the final withdrawal of the military forces of the Egyptian pharaohs of the new kingdom of Egypt sometime around 1130 from the latest evidence which marks the end of three centuries of, of Egyptian imperial rule um, in the Levant during the late Bronze Age. After the Bronze Age was the Iron Age, uh, as archeologists call it, from about 1200 or maybe 1130 until about 600 BC, uh, uh, at which point the Babylonian army under Nebuchadnezzar invaded from Southern Iraq and just devastated and depopulated the entire coast of the Levant. Uh, something we read about a lot in the Hebrew Bible, um, Old Testament, where it's a major event for the biblical writers. In the map on this slide, the Phoenician heartland is shown in green. It is a long, narrow strip of land bounded by the sea on the west and steep mountain ranges on the east, where there were dense forests in ancient times that were famous for tall cedar and pine trees that were highly prized as building material for palaces, temples, and other elite dwellings, and for building ships. In addition to timber, the products traded by Bronze Age Canaanites, let's say before 1200 BC, and by their Iron Age Phoenician descendants after 1200, included wine, olive oil, and purple dye. The famous Phoenician purple was a vivid and durable dye extracted from murex seashells of the kind shown in this slide, 
It was a much sought after by ancient elites and was exported far and wide by Phoenician merchants. It is symbolic of their skill in crafting luxury goods and the wealth they gained by selling those goods uh, to elite consumers, um, first of all, around the Eastern Mediterranean and then farther afield. Before we talk about the Phoenicians themselves, I would like to uh, take a few minutes to talk about the Bronze Age Canaanites from whom they were descended, who set the pattern for what we later, call, what later see as Phoenician maritime expertise and seafaring and navigation ability and also trade and financial ability. We know quite a bit about the Canaanites in the period from around 2000 BC until 1200, which scholars call the Middle and Late Bronze Ages. There are some written records and a lot of archeological evidence as well as depictions of Canaanites in Egyptian art. On the left in this, uh, bottom left in this slide is a modern artist's depiction of a scene of Canaanites coming and going in front of the monumental gate of the city of Ashkelon on the south coast of modern Israel, north of Gaza on the coast. Um, I was involved myself in excavating this site. I was there for 12 seasons of excavation as a long running dig of my professor. And the illustration here is quite accurate with respect to the ancient architecture, the massive uh, mud brick fortifications and towers, uh, and also uh, with respect to the hairstyles of the people, their multicolored clothing, and so on, reminiscent of the biblical character Joseph and his coat of many colors, which is a kind of Canaanite uh, characteristic. These details are taken from or extracted from ancient Egyptian depictions of the Canaanites, such as this black and white drawing shows in the bottom middle of the slide, which is a copy of an Egyptian relief showing a bearded Canaanite wearing a multicolored wraparound garment who has disembarked from a ship and is delivering goods to a seated Egyptian official at a port in the Nile Delta region. Here um, is another, I couldn't resist showing this slide. Uh, it's a famous example. Many of you might have seen this in National Geographic or, or other places. Here is a famous example of what we know was a very active Canaanite Bronze Age trading system by sea, connecting Egypt, the Levant, and Greece in the Bronze Age, or the late Bronze Age for sure. This shipwreck was found on the seabed near Ulu Barun, off the coast of southwestern Turkey, and it dates from around 1300 BC, and you know, the period of the Egyptian empire in Canaan and when a lot was going on uh, in terms of sea trade. The scuba diver in the photo on the right is holding an oxhide shaped copper ingot. Uh, metal and glass ingots were a major part of the cargo of this Canaanite ship and other ships like it, no doubt. And they would have been turned into manufactured goods at their destination. So the shipment of very expensive, valuable uh, commodities uh, like metal ingots, glass ingots, uh, you know, wine and uh, oil, perhaps special um, flavored wines and oils uh, was, was a major part of the cargo of ships like this. On the lower left is an artist's reconstruction of the hold of the ship, of the shipwreck, and its cargo based on the archaeological finds. And just above that um, drawing of the hold is an Egyptian depiction of the unloading of such a ship in Egypt under the supervision of its wealthy Canaanite captain, who is shown with a well-trimmed short beard in contrast to the clean shaven Egyptians and who is wearing a luxurious purple dyed cloak and wraparound tunic. So already well in the Bronze Age, this purple dye technology and the murex shell uh, were known uh, to the Canaanites. In the middle of this slide is a clay tablet with cuneiform writing from the same period as the ship, just a few decades earlier in fact, which is one of hundreds from an archive found at Amarna up the Nile in Egypt. It is a letter from a Canaanite ruler to the Egyptian Pharaoh. You know, as I say, there are dozens or hundreds of such letters. And in combination with the archeological finds, written documents like this give us a very good idea of the kinds of commodities that were shipped around the Eastern Mediterranean and also the strongly political context of this trade, regulated, politicized, and really government controlled, I believe, for the most part, not so much private trade in the Bronze Age. This is a topic of research for scholars, but I'm one of those who thinks that most of the trade uh, from the Egyptian domains, the Egyptian empire carried through by Canaanite traders and merchants was actually royally sponsored or government controlled uh, gift exchange or exchange of goods from one royal palace to another. 
That's what changes in the Iron Age. The Phoenicians actually pioneer forms of private entrepreneurial trade and market-oriented trade that is not so widely known in the Bronze Age, in my view. But let's ask a question. If the people who lived along the central coast of the Levant during the Iron Age, um, in the period after Egyptian imperial forces withdrew around 1130 BC, as we've said, if those people were just the descendants of Bronze Age Canaanite seafarers, like those who sailed this ship, why do we give them a different name and call them Phoenicians instead of Canaanites? I think it's very confusing for scholars and students who think that they might actually then be two different groups when they're not. Indeed, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, they are called Canaanites. They're not called Phoenicians in the Old Testament. Um, or more commonly, they're called Sidonians or Tyrians after the name of the, the city they're from, uh, using the names of the most important Phoenician cities of the Iron Age, Tyre and Sidon. Um, and there is some evidence, written evidence, that they called themselves Canaanites, although their primary identification uh, throughout this later period was in terms of which city they belonged to, Tyre, Sidon, Byblos, whatever city was their home. It was the Greeks, it was the Greek historical tradition, the Greek literary tradition, uh, the non-Semitic speaking outsiders who called them Phoenicians and had no idea about their Canaanite Bronze Age ancestry. Going back here, to this uh, slide with the maps, you can see the location of Tyre um, on the right-hand side in what is today the southern part of Lebanon and Sidon, the other major Phoenician city just north of it. These two cities have been continuously occupied for thousands of years and they still go by the same names um, or you know, the modern Arabic equivalent of these names, Tyre and Sidon. Uh, the primary self-identification of the Bronze Age Canaanites and of their Iron Age descendants, who we call Phoenicians by convention, following the Greeks, their primary identification was always with their home city, rather than with, than with the larger linguistic and cultural grouping to which they belonged, which was perhaps more salient to outsiders than it was to themselves. Um, I mean, the sense of uh, they were not part of a unified single state, and so they didn't have that strong identity. Um, uh, as Canaanites so much as uh, the city, the citizenship uh, uh, to which they belonged. On this slide is a map of the major Canaanite cities of the late Bronze Age on the right that had been absorbed into the Egyptian empire um, uh, quite a bit earlier in the 15th century BC and that functioned as administrative subunits within the Egyptian province of Canaan. So Canaan is first of all, a kind of Egyptian provincial category, the area they controlled in what's today um, Israel, the West Bank, and uh, uh, Lebanon, and, and parts of Syria. Um, let's see. The function is administrative subunits and is from Egyptian records and also from the Hebrew Bible that we know about the political landscape of this period, the names shown on this map. The geographical category of Canaan, the Bronze Age, and the geographical category of Phoenicia and the Iron Age Afterward, we're not native to this region, but were created by outsiders. The Egyptians first, who called it all Canaan, and then by the Israelites and the Greeks. And since there is a woeful lack of textual records um, remaining or surviving that were written by the Phoenicians themselves, we are dependent on Egyptian and Hebrew and Greek views of them. Having said that, there were some major cultural changes in the transition from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age that affected the coastal Canaanites and justifies giving them a new name as Phoenicians to make it easier for scholars to distinguish them from their cultural predecessors. There were indeed many cultural continuities in the period after the Egyptian empire withdrew in 1130 BC. The post-imperial populace that we would now call Phoenician in the Iron Age continued the religious traditions of their ancestors, um, you know, animal sacrifice, the temple style, temple ritual, and so on. They continued those traditions with some local variations, and they spoke a coastal dialect of the older Canaanite language, which gradually became distinct from the inland dialect of Canaanite that we call Hebrew, which is what Hebrew is. It's the inland dialect of Canaanite of the Bronze Age. Phoenician language is just the coastal dialect that had diverged uh, because of, uh, as time passed. Um, let's see, the, the 
Phoenicians, uh, or the Iron Age Canaanites, as I like to call them, also maintained many of the same economic practices and material styles in architecture and in uh, art. But their Canaanite traditions were actually disrupted to some extent and altered by a major change that affected the entire region. The invasion by powerful groups from the West, from the area of Greece, the Aegean Sea, uh, and maybe as far as Sicily, uh, we might think now, uh, invasion of powerful groups who are very different from the Canaanites, both culturally and linguistically. These groups are called sea peoples, following the ancient Egyptian designation for them, and they tried to conquer Egypt itself with a combined attack by land and sea in, well, we call it 1177 BC. It may not be exactly that date, but around 1177 BC or thereabouts. However, they were repelled by the Egyptian forces and were allowed to settle nearby in Canaan, where many scholars think they uh, served as Egyptian mercenaries. Having been defeated in battle, the Egyptians said, these are pretty good fighters. We could use them as imperial police, uh, non-Semitic people to settle them in Canaan and police are, you know, they're Canaanites that they are not related to there. And that would be the biblical Philistines as a good example of, of these people. Uh, let's see. Um, apparently serving as Egyptian mercenaries until the demise of the Egyptian empire, as we said, around 1130. So, you know, 45 years of, of that phase. This slide on the lower left shows an Egyptian relief uh, illustration depicting the battle against the Sea Peoples in 1177. The Pharaoh is shown uh, supersized there with his uh, uh, bow and arrow there. Um, and beside that is a modern artist's rendition of the battle with Egyptians fighting the invaders who had arrived on ships at the Delta of Egypt, the Nile Delta. The various groups of the Sea Peoples, of whom the biblical Philistines were one, took over a large chunk of southern coastal Canaan after the Egyptian forces withdrew in 1130 and eventually carved out their own city-states in the area closest to Egypt. They did not, however, conquer Tyre and Sidon and other Canaanite cities farther north in the central part of the Levantine coast, but they do seem to have had an impact on those cities which probably absorbed Sea People's immigrants who brought with them new funerary practices involving cremation as a, a distinctive uh, practice and who probably would have brought with them valuable military skills and expertise in seafaring and navigation as well as knowledge of the Western Mediterranean of the Greek islands and, and we think uh, Sicily. I keep saying Sicily because a recent study of ancient DNA from the remains of Philistine children that had been buried under the floor at Ashkelon. Ashkelon is, became, became a Philistine site, became one of these places taken over by the Philistines. Ancient DNA work has recently shown that the parents of those children who were born and died as children in Ashkelon, in Canaan, came from either uh, Crete or Sicily. So a really direct DNA proof of this migration of the Sea Peoples, including Philistines, from uh, that uh, region to the west over into the Levant. <clears throat> the incorporation of the Sea Peoples and the withdrawal of the Egyptian empire created new conditions in Iron Age Canaan, out of which emerged a new political configuration by the second half of the 10th century in the period around 950 to 900 BC, the patchwork of small Canaanite um, cities, polities that the Egyptians had divided and conquered for centuries gave way to several powerful independent kingdoms that sort of coalesced from the, the remnants of the Egyptian empire. A sea people's kingdom of the Philistines in the south led by the city of Gat, Goliath of the Bible was from Gat. Um, a large kingdom called Israel, in the central part of the country and a smaller kingdom called Judah, well known to us from the Bible. An Aramean kingdom centered on Damascus uh, up on in, to the northeast and a kingdom ruled from Tyre, we think, many think, shown in yellow here on this map, which for centuries was the center of Phoenician culture and power and neighbored, was the direct neighbor then of the new kingdom of Israel. So this is the picture we have in the Bible of Tyre 
Hiram of Tyre and the Kingdom of Israel adjacent. The chronological chart on this slide, which is provided by my uh, colleague and collaborator in Israel, Gunnar Lehman, Professor Gunnar Lehman, as was the map you see here. Uh, this chart summarizes what we know from biblical and Greek sources about the kings of Tyre. The two most important kings were Hiram I, who ruled about 950 to 917 BC. You can see uh, him shown there on the history column of the chart, Hiram I. Uh, and he was a contemporary of both King David and King Solomon of Israel, and recorded in the Bible as such. And then Ethbal I, or Itobal in Phoenician, who ruled from 879 to 848 BC and was a contemporary of King Omri and his son, King Ahab of Israel. Indeed, it's very, no one doubts a political alliance was formed between the kingdom of Tyre and the kingdom of Israel by the marriage of Ahab, crown prince of Israel, to the infamous Jezebel, a Phoenician princess who was the daughter of Ethbal I. That's who Jezebel was. She was a Canaanite Phoenician princess of Tyre, daughter of the king of Tyre in that period. 879 to 848. This indicates the close economic and political relationship and military alliance even between Tyre and Israel, which were two powerful kingdoms with complementary economies and interests. Tyre focused on mercantile exchange, sea trade, luxury good production. Israel focused on primary products, grain, oil, wine, and largely rural as opposed to the more urbanized Tyre. Okay, um, this alliance, of course, the political alliance between Israel and Tyre was criticized severely in certain circles in Israel uh, with hatred focused on the evil foreign queen Jezebel, as we know from the biblical stories in the book of Kings concerning Elijah the prophet and his harsh condemnation of Jezebel for introducing Phoenician religious practices. Uh, an etching by Gustav Doré shown in this slide depicts the biblical episode of the defenestration of Jezebel uh, when she was thrown out of a window and left for the dogs to lick her blood in the rather vivid and grisly language of the Bible after a military coup instigated by Damascus, by the way, had overthrown the dynasty of Omri and Ahab. She was still alive, um, the surviving, shall we say queen, uh, widowed queen, uh, did not meet a happy end after uh, the, the, that dynasty ceased. Anyway, the point I want to make here, we could go on all day about uh, the historical background, but the point I want to make here is that Iron Age Phoenicians should not be thought of as living in a loose collection of small and militarily weak mercantile city-states just strung out along the coast and independent of one another, as many scholars have imagined. This is not the situation in the 10th and 9th uh, centuries BC. Rather, all the evidence suggests that, that the Phoenicians, that, that the Bible knows anyway, were the inhabitants of a militarily powerful and unified kingdom ruled from the city of Tyre, which had conquered its neighbors and dominated the other coastal cities to its north and south, even though those old cities retained their own identities, Sidon, for example, Byblos, and so on, and had their own local elites. Although the kingdom of Tyre, which extended a long way along the coast from modern Haifa in Israel to Latakia in Syria, was hemmed in by the mountains, the high Lebanon mountain range, and was more of a naval power than a land power, it was obviously able to defend its territory and was on a par militarily with its neighbors. This kingdom was consolidated by Hiram of Tyre in the 10th century BC at the same time that David and Solomon consolidated the kingdom of Israel, and Tyre continued to be a major power for the next 200 years until the entire region was conquered by the Assyrians from northern Iraq and game over for the local powers. So with powerful neighbors to the east, um, a land empire was never an option for Tyre, and by powerful neighbors I mean Damascus, I mean Israel, and of course the mountains that made it difficult for them to march east inland. They were never a land empire, but the sea to the west was wide open. In the 10th and 9th centuries, there was no imperial power to block 
their westward expansion. Egypt was gone, no empires for a while, uh, no pharaohs telling them what to do. Recent archeological work has shown that the Phoenicians from Tyre sailed all the way to Spain through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Atlantic Ocean well before 900 BC, probably in the time of Hiram the first, and perhaps as early as 1000 BC. It is generally agreed that they went in search of silver and other metals such as copper, which are abundant in Southwestern Spain, uh, along the Rio Tinto uh, and in Sardinia, the island of Sardinia, where there's early evidence of Phoenician activity. If you wanna see on the map, Southwestern Spain uh, on the Atlantic side of, of Spain, and then Sardinia as well. Uh, and in Sardinia, there's very early evidence of Phoenician activity as well. These initial expeditions in search of valuable metals eventually led to the establishment of colonies of Phoenicians in Spain, Sardinia, Sicily, and then North Africa um, uh, and farther points farther east. It is a matter of debate, and this is one of the things that my research and uh, my colleagues and I are really interested in finding out, it's a matter of debate exactly how early these Phoenician colonies were established after the initial trading explorations and how long a gap there was between initial contact and the initial venture trade, shall we say, to just fetch silver cargoes and bring them back, how long between that and the actual investment in colonies where they sent out thousands of colonists with all the tools and infrastructure and animals to establish these colonies. There's a gap and we just wanna know how long that is and why they waited so long to colonize. Recent work has shown that colonies in Southern Spain were in place um, probably by 850 BC or the, you know, the latter part of the ninth century. Uh, hard to say exactly, but maybe as early as 850 BC. Uh, and the initial voyages of exploration, as I've said, took place much earlier, maybe a hundred years earlier, as shown by Phoenician pottery found at uh, Spanish sites on the Atlantic coast. It is plausible to imagine, therefore, that the first expeditions in search of silver were a kind of venture trade, as it's called, sent out by Hiram of Tyre around 950, after he had consolidated the kingdom of Tyre, and at the time when his ally Solomon was ruling the kingdom of Israel, which confirms the biblical tradition on this topic um, that there were uh, kind of a venture, um, a partnership between Solomon and Hiram to send ships to Tarshish, which we think is Western Spain. Later on, Tyrian fleets brought permanent colonists uh, who were sent out perhaps in the reign of Ethbal I, uh, father of Jezebel, uh, perhaps before 850 or maybe during the time of his daughter Jezebel when she was married to Ahab, king of Israel. And the question remains as to whether the Israelites were also involved in the colonization effort and in uh, supporting this uh, colonial venture. Uh, in any case, uh, the puzzle remains, why was there such a long period of episodic venture trade before permanent colonization and exploitation of Spain by Phoenician colonists themselves? <clears throat> the chronology of Phoenician settlement is a major topic for search, as I've said. Uh, we'll return to that at the end of the lecture, but it's interesting to note at this point that the earliest colonies of the Phoenicians, uh, when they did happen, were located were the ones located farthest to the west, farthest away from the homeland, which seems a little counterintuitive. For example, uh, the famous city of Carthage in Tunisia, you can see that where that is opposite Sicily, the, the great city of Carthage in Tunisia, which became the most important daughter city of Tyre uh, and the capital of a later Carthaginian empire. It was founded quite a bit later than the Spanish colonies, probably after, well after 800 BC. So it is uh, not a matter of gradual geographical expansion westward, but rather a sudden leap all the way through the Straits of Gibraltar far to the west to obtain a prized and valuable commodity, mainly silver, followed eventually by the filling out of that trade network by the establishment of intervening colonies in later generations. The pioneering of maritime trade routes and the establishment of ports connecting the Eastern and Western Mediterranean which had had no systematic contacts beforehand, right? They were unknown to each other, is one of the great achievements of the Phoenicians. 
It is not uh, that there was a lack of sailing ships in earlier centuries, not at all. People had the same kind of ships long before this exploration happened. Uh, and it was not that these Western resources, especially silver, were not of interest to the Easterners who would have loved to get their hands on them long sooner, long before. The connection could well have been made hundreds of years earlier than it was. So what explains it? Well, it has to do with a combination of political and economic factors, I think, rooted in the consolidation of power in this dynamic kingdom of Tyre under Hiram. Uh, because the rulers of Tyre, of this new uh, kingdom of the Phoenicians, were equipped with the knowledge, gained maybe from the sea peoples, the resources, because of the size and strength of their kingdom, and the motivation, because they couldn't expand eastward, so had to go west, to make the connection in the 10th century BC, that is the period before 900, which is when the connection happened, which in turn had dramatic long-term effects on the entire economy and culture of the Mediterranean region, from Gibraltar to all the way back to Egypt. In a real sense, uh, I would say the Phoenicians uh, made the Mediterranean or created the economic space of the Mediterranean that was later on inherited by the Greeks and Romans following in their footsteps. However, and here I, I cannot get, get a talk on the Phoenicians uh, finish without mentioning uh, the alphabet, our alphabet, which is their alphabet. A Phoenician contribution of even greater importance to world history than exploring the Mediterranean was the dissemination of the alphabet throughout the Mediterranean world. Writing, the ability to read and write had been known for 2000 years before the Phoenicians came on the scene. But earlier writing systems, such as the Mesopotamian cuneiform system, we saw a tablet of that before, and Egyptian hieroglyphs, these were logosyllabic uh, writing systems with uh, characters standing for either whole words or ideas or just syllables, as opposed to alphabetic writing systems where the symbol stands for a single consonant or vowel. The earlier writing systems made use of hundreds of written signs, each of which represented an entire word or syllable rather than a single consonant or vowel. And those writing systems were very difficult to learn and restricted to a small scribal elite. It took a lot of training to read and write. During the Middle and Late Bronze Ages, however, uh, as early as 1800 BC, in fact, in Canaan, a new and much simpler writing system was invented by the Canaanites adapting the idea of Egyptian hieroglyphs, but breaking through to this alphabetic principle, like a real intellectual breakthrough, uh, resulting in the radical, radical simplification of the writing system. This first alphabet, which is called Proto-Sinaitic because the first examples are found in the Sinai Peninsula, is one in which each written sign represents a single consonant, a single um, consonantal sound, rather than an entire word or even a syllable. A syllable has a consonant and a vowel, usually. In other words, there would be a, a sign in Phoenician uh, proto sinaitic or so-called Old Canaanite script, a sign to represent just the sound b, b, b. Instead of writing, having signs for different syllables, ba, ba, bi, bo, bu, which was the old system. That means that fewer than 30 signs were needed to represent all of the consonants used in Canaanite and other Semitic languages. And in those languages, you did not need to write the vowels as modern Hebrew and Arabic. They don't write vowels because you can predict the vowels from the pattern of the consonants and from knowledge of the language. Uh, so there's no need for vowel signs in the Phoenician alphabet. In the earliest Canaanite alphabets, each letter was originally a picture of something whose name uh, started with a particular Canaanite consonant. Thus a squiggly line depicting the surface of water was used to represent the first consonantal sound in the Canaanite word for water, which is mem, mem is the word for water in Canaanite. And this uh, mem or mayam in Hebrew, and this uh, squiggle is the ancestor of our Latin letter M. Think of a capital M as you see on this chart. It's uh, a wavy, so it's a symbol of the waves on water is what M is in, in our alphabet even today. A few examples are shown in this slide corresponding to the Latin letters A, capital A, M, and O. Even today, our capital letter A, for example, betrays its origins as a rotated picture of an ox head with two horns, right? Ox head in proto-Sinaitic, uh, Phoenician simplifies it to this 
looks like a capital A on its side. That's the ox head with the horns and Latin just rotates it right around so the horns are pointing downward. But that's what it is. It's a picture of an ox head. And why is it a picture of an ox head? Because um, the ox head was used to represent the, uh, not the vowel A as we have it, but a glottal stop. Oh, oh. This, this glottal stop consonant in Semitic languages, which is a meaningful consonant uh, in Canaanite and other in Hebrew and, and Arabic. A sign for the glottal stop is not needed to write Greek. So the Phoenician letter Alp, which is the word for ox, Alp, um, whose first sound was uh, was the glottal stop. That sign, the ox head sign for Alp or Alp, uh, was adapted to represent the vowel A by the Creeks, who kept the Phoenician name of the letter and called it Alpha. Alp or Aleph is Alpha. Doesn't mean anything in Greek. It means something in Canaanite. It means ox. The second letter of the Canaanite alphabet was called bait, which is the word for house in Phoenician and Canaanite. Thus, a schematic picture of a house with an open door represents the consonant b, uh, the first sound of, of bait, um, of house, and is the ancestor of the Greek letter beta. Again, they just kept the Canaanite name, beta. And the Latin letter B is ultimately derived, or the capital B from the house picture. So when we say the word alphabet, we are saying ox house in ancient Canaanite and Phoenician, reciting the first two words in the mnemonic scheme that underlies every alphabet today. The Phoenicians of the Iron Age, actually, Tyre, for example, didn't invent the alphabet. It had been around for a few hundred years, several hundred years in the Canaanite world of the Bronze Age but they standardized the shapes and direction of writing of the old Canaanite letters, and they disseminated their version of this simple and easy to use writing system to their neighbors, the Israelites, the Arameans and Damascus, and eventually to the Greeks. The Phoenician cultural prestige was such that other versions of the alphabet died out. The Phoenician version of the alphabet is the ancestor of all the alphabets in use today, including Hebrew, Arabic, Greek, Latin, and Cyrillic alphabets. In the fourth century, in the four centuries, 400 years between the time when the Egyptians withdrew from Canaan in 1130 and the Assyrians invaded and conquered the region in the 730s BC, the Phoenicians were not part of any big empire. They were just dealing with their own you know, matters and they had no incentive and no desire to use uh, a cumbersome logosyllabic writing system with hundreds of signs such as were used in Egypt and Mesopotamia. They were out from under the thumb of those empires and didn't use their complicated writing systems, which means they had the freedom to perfect the Canaanite alphabet and to make it their primary means of written communication, which had tremendous effects in terms of literacy and the spread of reading and writing um, in every culture since then. The Phoenicians took their alphabet with them and used it to write documents in their colonies in the Western Mediterranean almost all of which have since been lost, sadly, because they were written on papyrus or perishable materials, with the exception of a few stone inscriptions like this Nora stone found at Nora in Sardinia, uh, which is dated to around 800 BC and shows this Phoenician alphabet uh, in use. But remember, we're seeing a tiny, tiny fraction of Phoenician writing when we just have a few stone inscriptions. So armed with the alphabet, and with a growing network of maritime shipping routes and colonial ports, the Phoenicians pioneered new methods of trade and finance that transformed the ancient economy. Coined money had not yet been invented. Coinage doesn't come in until um, after 600 BC. Coined money had not yet been invented, so the means of payment was silver that had been chopped up into little pieces of various size to make it easy to weigh uh, out precise amounts of silver on a balance scale. Scholars use the German uh, word Hacksilber for this, hacked up silver, <laughs> Hacksilber. And a cache of Hacksilber was found in an archeological excavation uh, or that's shown on the slide here, uh, just for comparison. You can see it's sort of bits of jewelry and other silver stuff that had been made into artifacts and now just recycled by being chopped up so it could be weighed out. And you can be like, oh, I got too much on the, scale balance, let me pull out one of these little chopped up bits to get the right weight, to have a shekel weight, say, uh, of, of silver. So standardized stone, uh, pardon me, um, yes, yeah, so we have a balance scale showing you um, 
how that works. Standardized stone weights of various sizes were used in the other balance pan, right? Silver in one pan and a standardized weight in the other to determine the amount of silver that corresponded to a certain number of shekels, shekel being a unit of weight, like pound later, right? We British pounds or pesos. I mean, these are all words that come from the weighing out of amounts of precious metal. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there is archaeological evidence, uh, interestingly, for a great increase in the amount of hock silver that was in circulation during the later part of the Iron Age in the 8th and 7th and 6th centuries as market transactions conducted by Phoenician merchants increased greatly in number. And as this practice of buying and selling using weighing out of silver came to be imitated by other people. I mean, it was known long before, of course, in Egypt and Mesopotamia, but it was taken um, throughout the Mediterranean by the Phoenicians. The remains of an Iron Age of uh, an Iron Age Tyrian shipwreck, you can see here in the lower right, this is what's left of the shipwreck. All the wood has rotted away, but you see the cargo of the ship scattered on the, on the seafloor um, is shown in the bottom right corner. This dates to about 750 BC. And it attests to regular large scale shipments of commodities such as olive oil and wine uh, that were uh, put into hundreds of standardized shipping containers, these ceramic jars that are shaped like torpedoes, they're called torpedo jars, the torpedo shape, hundreds of them in each ship stowed in the holds of the ships. Uh, sadly, um, this is actually very uh, preserved well because it's very deep uh, sea, it's found by a robotic explorer um, on the seafloor but the, the wood has all been eaten up by microbes. Although we lack the commercial records of the Phoenicians, if only we had their archives, their libraries, with all of their commercial transactions written down in papyrus, uh, we lack them, but we are convinced by indirect uh, evidence that they develop, had developed sophisticated techniques for recording transactions and keeping track of debts and payments uh, fairly early on in this period. Temporary notes were written in wax, inscribed in wax on wooden tablets, like you see on the upper right. That's an actual wooden tablet with, with an ivory hinge, would have been coated with beeswax in the, in the inset part of the wood to make this um, hinged uh, you know, diptych or tablet, but you could uh, write notes and temporary uh, messages and so on just in the wax and then transcribe them later. Uh, temporary notes were inscribed in wax uh, before being transferred to more permanent records written in ink on papyrus, at which point the wax was smoothed to erase the notes and create a blank surface for new notation. The wooden diptych with ivory hinge shown in the upper right corner is evidence of this practice. Finally, um, although we have said very little about Phoenician religion and mythology and art, don't have time for that today, um, and uh, it is important to note that the Phoenicians conveyed to the Israelites and the Greeks, not just the technique of alphabetic writing, but also the contents of their own Canaanite traditions concerning the universe, the cosmos, the gods, religious rituals, and so on, quite likely in written form, you know, this is how you do the ritual written down, uh, although the Phoenician versions of those documents have been lost. This cultural influence can be seen quite plainly in the Hebrew Bible and in early Greek literature, such as Hesiod's Theogony. A good book on this topic is shown in the bottom left of this slide called When the Gods Were Born, Greek Cosmogonies in the Near East, written by my collaborator uh, in Spain, Carolina Lopez Ruiz, who earned her PhD at the University of Chicago uh, some years ago. Cultural features as basic as the characteristics of the chief god of the pantheon, uh, the architectural form of temples, the ritual practices, involving animal sacrifice. All these were clearly borrowed from Phoenician sources by the Greeks, just as the Romans later borrowed in turn from Greek culture. The Greek god Zeus, for example, shown in this slide holding his thunderbolt on the right of the slide is, a very, is very similar to the Canaanite and Phoenician storm god Baal, who in Bronze Age Canaanite tradition arose to kingship over the gods and held court on top of a cloud wreathed mountain in the north, uh, Mount Saphon, uh, uh, like the later Zeus on Mount Olympus, who held court on the top of a mountain, uh, inaccessible mountain in the north. Phoenicians from Tyre are credited in the Hebrew Bible with designing the temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, the temple of the Israelite God, and of overseeing its construction. 
In the bottom middle of this slide is an artist's depiction of Solomon's temple based on the biblical description of it, which indeed resembles Canaanite examples unearthed by archeologists. Uh, more fancifully to the left of that temple drawing, the artist here is imagining a meeting between Solomon and Hiram of Tyre to plan the construction of the temple, showing him a blueprint. Oh, I think that's maybe a bit much and uh, shows artistic imagination. In the remainder of this presentation, and I, I need to stop soon, so I'm, I'm just going to say a few things about, um, about uh, some of my archaeological work. I want to talk briefly about the research I've been conducting at Phoenician sites on behalf of the University of Chicago. In 2015, we began work at the site of Tel Quesan, north of Haifa in Israel. You can see the web address there. This is a classic Middle Eastern ruin mound, or Tel in, the, in modern Arabic and Hebrew. Tell is the word for this kind of ruin mound uh, that has many strata of ancient settlements built up and superimposed one on top of the other. The earliest occupation of this site was in the third millennium BC, maybe 3000 BC or earlier uh, in the early Bronze Age. And it was occupied by Bronze Age Canaanites for a long time and then by Iron Age Phoenicians until it was destroyed by the Babylonians, darn Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar around 600 BC. Uh, time of the prophet Jeremiah of the Bible and the destruction of Jerusalem happened. Uh, Babylonian exile of the Judeans happened a little bit later. The site Tel Quesan was then reoccupied later during the Persian and Hellenistic periods before it was finally abandoned around 150 BC, um, a, a bit before the Roman conquest of the whole area. My colleagues and I are focusing on the Iron Age period, six, uh, 1200 to 600 BC, the one we've been talking about, the period of Hiram and Jezebel and so on, in order to understand the cultural and political changes that the people who lived here would have experienced in the transition from the Bronze Age Canaanite world under Egyptian imperial rule through the period of the Sea People's invasions from the West, and then into the Phoenician period after Tel Quesan became part of the kingdom of Tyre, so we think around 950 BC, and then served as a, a gateway or a border town um, of the neighboring kingdom of Israel. You can see that on the map here. We uh, began, uh, we've been conducting one month summer field schools excavations at Tel Quesan, uh, 2016, 2018, 2019. We had three seasons there before COVID hit with several dozen uh, students from the University of Chicago and elsewhere or volunteers of all ages, really. And by the way, if you're interested in volunteering for the dig, you can go to our website and then and drop me a line and we can see whether something you might wanna do. We're digging there in August this year. Again, COVID willing, as they say. The students uh, learn archeological techniques of excavation and digital recording, supplemented by evening lectures and weekend field trips to other museums and sites. They work very hard. Uh, Andrew can attest to how hard they work physically in, in high heat and dust and, and dirt, but they have a lot of fun. And we, as I said, are planning to go back there and resume four more seasons every month, every August for the next four years, starting this year. Uh, the um, research at Tel Quesan in the ancient Phoenician homeland in, part, in the kingdom of Tyre will continue. Uh, but we are now looking forward to creating a new field school program at the other end of the Mediterranean, at, the Phoenician, at a Phoenician colony site in southern Spain. We are following in the wake of the Phoenicians from their homeland in the east to their colonies in the west uh, to dig at an archaeological site near the city of Malaga, a big city on the south coast of Spain, for those of you who have been there, uh, a site called Cerro del Viar, and we may dig there as early as this September, if all goes well that we're waiting for uh, final permissions from the government. This site is the location of one of the earlier Phoenician colonies in Spain. And digging there will help us to answer questions about when the colonization happened, maybe why it happened, and uh, what kind of economic uh, impact it had, both in Spain and back home in the homeland in Tyre. We're doing this, uh, Chicago is doing this in collaboration with the University of Malaga, Spanish colleagues there, uh, under the direction of my friend Jose Suarez Padilla, who is teaching archaeology in Malaga and is a great expert on the archaeology of this period. Malaga is an ideal location, uh, not just to investigate the Phoenicians, 
but also to teach students archeological field methods and to expose them to the broad sweep of Mediterranean history that is so well represented in Andalusia, uh, ranging from pre-Phoenician Bronze Age cultures of uh, the Celts, uh, Celtic culture and, and others, all the way through the Phoenician, Punic, Roman, Visigoth, <laughs> and then Islamic periods, um, and, and you know, up till Ferdinand and Isabella reconquered um, the region uh, as, as Roman Catholic conquerors. We will take students to visit sites and museums in this area, such as the Alhambra in Granada, a very famous World Heritage Site, uh, north of Malaga, up, up in the hills. Here's a plan just briefly uh, showing the previous excavation areas um, at this site at Ferro del Villar with an artist reconstruction of what the Phoenicians uh, buildings looked like. Uh, and actually that's there. Um, oh yeah, I'm skipping ahead too far in my script. Here is a map showing the location of Ferro del Villar on the outskirts of the city of Malaga, the modern city, close to the airport. And if you land in the airport there, you almost hit the site near the mouth of the Waddle Horthe River not far from the beach in what is today a nature preserve. Uh, the yellow arrow points to the grassy low mound, which is the archeological site itself. A modern elevated highway skirts the mound. Thankfully, because the archeologists checked it out and said, you cannot blast a highway through this ancient city. And so they diverted the highway around it. Um, in ancient times, the site was an island in the mouth of the river. It wasn't on the mainland, it was an island in classic Phoenician fashion but the estuary has since been filled in and the river is confined to the narrow channel that you see there. A small part of the site was excavated in the 1980s, revealing the foundations of Phoenician buildings not far beneath the surface, but there's much more to be done to excavate the entire settlement and understand how it developed over time um, from its founding in the ninth century sometime uh, uh, until its abandonment around 600 BC. So maybe 200, 250 years of occupation. It was abandoned when its inhabitants moved from the island to the mainland to found a new colony called Malaka in Phoenician, Mem Lamed Kaf in the Canaanite alphabet. Uh, this Phoenician name is still preserved in the modern name Malaga, which is not Spanish or Arabic, but Phoenician. However, ancient Malaka, the town of Malaka is buried deeply under the modern city and the earlier settlement at Thero del Biar has a great advantage in comparison to many other Phoenician sites in the area that it was not built over or destroyed in later times. Um, it's fairly early in the process and its remains are accessible just under the surface and are relatively well preserved. Here is a plan of the site showing the previous excavation areas with an artist reconstruction in the top right of what the Phoenician buildings looked like, just like they would have looked back home in what is now Lebanon and Israel and the Phoenician homeland. They were built in the same style as buildings um, in Tyre and it's uh, in Tel Quezon for that matter. In one area, they faced onto a main street and they were open at the front to create stalls or shops suitable for trading uh, in a market-like setting. And there's got really nice evidence of that at this site, fitting very well with our notion of that by now, by the time these towns are being founded in Spain, there's a very market-oriented private trading culture at work. But here's what's interesting. There is no evidence that, the, that any non-Phoenicians, any native um, Iberians lived on this island. The pottery is purely local and Phoenician. So what's going on there in terms of interaction with the local people? And to be fair, not many local people would have lived nearby as far as we know from the um, work being done on the mainland. This map shows the location of Thero del Villar and Malacca uh, in relation to the other early Phoenician sites on the south coast of Spain. Um, on the Atlantic coast west of Gibraltar is the island of Gadir, modern Cadiz, uh, uh, with some sites also farther inland. Ronda is a famous site, a famous, made famous by Ernest Hemingway in one of his novels. It's where there's a great chasm or gorge in the middle of town, this ancient Phoenician site where um, I forget which side in the Spanish Civil War massacred their opponents by throwing them into the, into the gorge of Ronda. If you ever get a chance to visit it, it's a spectacular place itself. Okay, um, let's see. The drawing on the right is an artist reconstruction of the island of Thero del Villar that we want to excavate as it would have been um, 
3,000 years ago in the mouth of the river. The Phoenicians preferred to settle on islands just offshore, imitating the mother city of Tyre itself, which was an island, and therefore easy to defend from, by, uh, from an attack by land if you had a good navy to, to protect your island. What we don't yet know is when Thero del Biar on the Mediterranean side of the Strait of Gibraltar was first settled and why exactly, as I've said. It is not in the silver producing region, which is on the Western Atlantic side. So why would they settle there? No silver, no precious metals. How did it relate to the earlier Tyrian settlement at Gadir? Uh, in both, and in both cases, why did the Phoenicians wait so long to establish colonies until long after they had first started sailing to Spain to get the silver? Um, so we, we were, we're hoping to explore these questions here. I won't read all of these um, and maybe we can come back to them in the Q&A are some of the major research questions. When did they colonize? Where were their colonies? Why did they <laughs> go so far west uh, so early? Um, how did they do it? Like the mechanics of the colonization and the scale of the colonization. And then really the last question is fascinating from a long-term economic and political perspective. What was the impact of this colonization? Not just on Spain, where, um, where the, the Phoenicians introduced you know, new culture and also wine and olive oil and that sort of thing, but on the politics of the homeland, which we think in this period went from being a kind of typical Bronze Age autocratic monarchy with strong government control of trade to a more freewheeling mercantile oligarchy. That seems what, to be what happened there. Okay, finally, and uh, I really have to make this finally since my time is up, um, I, I can't uh, end without making a reference to uh, one of the most famous Phoenicians of them all, uh, Hannibal of Carthage, who marched via Spain. The Carthaginian Empire is shown in, in orange there. Hannibal marched via Spain and across the Alps with his elephants into Italy in 218 BC. Uh, what are we saying? 700 years after the first Phoenician colonization. And he almost succeeded in conquering Rome. Uh, as we know from uh, Roman accounts of, of this campaign. By the time of the Punic Wars, when Carthage and Rome fought to the death for control of the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians had built a thriving civilization in North Africa, Spain, Sicily, Sardinia, and all these places you can see on the map. The early Phoenician expeditions in the 10th century BC, as I say, 700 years previously, and the colonies of the 9th and 8th centuries had paved the way for this large scale transplantation of the Semitic speaking culture of the Levant uh, more than 2000 miles to the West. Um, Phoenician society in the West developed its own distinctive features while maintaining close relations with the mother city of Tyre. And as I've said, the transplanting was quite literal in some respects, although it is hard to think of Spain as having no olive oil or wine at all which were unknown in Iberia until the Phoenicians arrived, uh, bringing olive and grape cuttings with them in their ships, along with livestock and other items needed to recreate the conditions in their homeland. The Phoenicians had an enormous cultural impact and they were pioneers in knitting together the Mediterranean as a single space of economic and cultural interaction by means of their ships and their alphabet, and they were responsible uh, even for disseminating what we think of as the Mediterranean diet. Under Hannibal's command, they nearly succeeded in dominating this space entirely, uh, but ultimately Rome won out and took over the Mediterranean world. Didn't have to happen that way. There's a great alternative history you could write about what if Hannibal had conquered Rome, uh, but the Romans won out um, and took over the Mediterranean world in the process destroying not just the city of Carthage, but the future of Phoenician culture. Their literature and laws were not preserved by their conquerors and all but a few distorted memories of them had been lost until modern times. It is one of the great achievements of archeological research to have learned as much as we have about the Phoenicians, but there is a lot more to do. Many Phoenician settlements are waiting to be explored. Many questions about them remain to be answered. I hope I have shown why it is worth trying to find the answers. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now it's time for Q&A. I see uh, almost 20 questions coming in. Uh, we have viewers checking in from Brazil, Singapore, the UK, Turkey, Spain, Poland, 
even exotic places like Minnesota, San Diego. Um, so many people have uh, been, been watching with much interest, David, and really appreciate uh, the very interesting content. I'll, I'll just jump in with a couple of questions as they're, they're kind of listed to me. Uh, Jenny Wokawiki asks, what traits do you admire of the ancient entrepreneurs and what specific parts of their trade and finance practices have carried through to our modern, modern economy? Right, that's a great question. Well, you know, you can tell I admire them. I mean, every archeologist falls in love with the people um, that he studies. It's just human nature. I did sort of, diplom uh, sort of politely omit the fact that they committed human sacrifice and burned, you know, their children. <laughs> as we know. So there's that sort of unsavory aspect of Phoenician culture. Uh, but what's admirable, I think, is first in the Canaanite Bronze Age, um, just the, the sheer daring and skill to navigate the open sea. I mean, of course, they, they did try to keep within sight of land, but still it was the Mediterranean is not necessarily a very calm sea all times of the year. In open vessels originally with a single mast and sail, just to be able to go so far, and to, um, uh, and to you know, move goods and connect and be willing to be open to other cultures and learn other languages and connect to other people. This is, they're the real pioneers in this, uh, sort of the glue that held the other cultures of the Mediterranean together. In terms of uh, trade and finance practices, as I said, I'm of the persuasion, there's a big debate among scholars, but I think that there was relatively little private market exchange, private, you know, based on supply and demand and, and market signals and so on. Uh, in the Bronze Age, because there's so much evidence of an incredibly uh, strong, uh, you know, monopoly power and physical control of the ships, the ports and the trade by kings, by, by, by rulers, um, whose interest it was to control all of these luxury goods and to exchange them with other rulers or as diplomatic gifts or as to give to elites. So, so the exchange of goods earlier on was much more a luxury exchange geared toward diplomacy and prestige building. We call a prestige economy. And uh, the traders, the merchants, the sailors, they were, they, they probably traded on the side. They probably did a lot of, you know, so we say black market trade and made a buck, but most of the goods and services are under tight control of these autocratic monarchies. So what the Phoenicians of the Iron Age did, when you think about it, they weren't under a big empire. They started out with an autocratic mon monarchy. I ha happen to think Hiram of Tyre and Solomon were not free traders. <laughs> they controlled tightly these goods. They're sending the ships, the venture trade to Spain. They have you know, um, royal officials and police there to make sure they bring them back and they don't sell them on the way. So, so this is tightly controlled, I think, initially. But then the very act of founding colonies of traders so far from home put them out of the effective control of the king of Tyre, right? So you were actually, just like in the New World in North America, you had, you know, these British royal charters and you had colonies established in uh, the eastern coast of North America, and very quickly in the 17th century, when the English Civil War happened, you had the enormous growth of bourgeois, middle-class, private entrepreneurial traders who resisted and, and, and didn't like the high taxation and the control of their trade by government. And so that's sort of the birth of uh, the free market, um, market trading system of uh, Britain and America and then uh, beyond that. So I realize I'm for economic historians are, are sort of like covering their eyes at how simplistic I'm presenting, simplistically I'm presenting this, but I do think there's something to that model, which is that an unintended consequence of establishing far-flung colonies of thousands of people uh, eventually let those people act quite independently of the monarchy while still being, you know, notionally connected. And that led to what I would call mercantile oligarchy, where the political elites of Tyre and the colonies were basically the heads of great merchant households who were very interested in, um, you know, market trade. Now we don't, this is a model and we wish we had uh, written documentation to really show how this happened but the little pieces we can glean from like the, the, the practices of, of weighing out silver and so on suggest much more retail trade, right? So when you have a negotiated exchange between one king and another, they've just sent an ambassador with a letter that's just listing 
you know, how many zillion dollars worth of goods I'm giving to you and this is what you give me back, it's, it's not retail. So the idea of the increase of retail trade as shown by some of these archeological finds um, says to me that, you know, by the eighth and seventh century before the Greeks really get, on, get in on the act, there's a booming market trade. And then we know from Greek sources in the later Greek period that there really was a lot of market exchange in the Mediterranean. So long answer to a great question. Thank you. Uh, quite a few questions on how far did the Phoenicians sort of get. Barry O'Reilly asks, is there evidence of settlements down the west coast of Africa or on the Canary Islands? A few comments in, in the YouTube, YouTube posts about, you know, sort of the, the popular his history channel stuff about uh, New World, um, but just sort of what are the, I guess, what are the criteria for how do you determine what their extent of their colonies? So just, just like with Iberia, Spain and Portugal, people had all kinds of guesses until we started finding Phoenician pottery of the right period, right? You know, of, of you know, 1900 BC, first the pottery and then radiocarbon dating was done. So that now we know they're, they're in on the Atlantic side of Spain and Portugal already before 900 probably. And it's possible that they got all the way up to Cornwall. The old idea is, did they get all the way to Cornwall for the tin? You know, by the time you're in the Bay of Biscay and, you know, <laughs> Western coast of Spain, you know, it's not crazy to think that. Ireland, who knows? So you just, there's no uh, empirical proof of that. Same with down the west coast of Africa. Herodotus, the Greek historian, suggests there's a tradition anyway that they went all the way around and circumnavigated Africa because he says the report was, you know, they were sailing south and south and south, and then, some, then the sun started rising on the other side of the boat, right? You know, they rounded the, the uh, you know, Cape of, um, what is it? Oh, anyway, Cape Town. And uh, we don't know archeologically if that's true, but there is some tradition there. As for the new world getting across to um, North America or South America, there've been lots of proposals and there's some uh, great forgeries and scams. Like I think there was a Phoenician inscription found in Tennessee um, many, many years ago. And it took a while, but scholars looked and said, what, wait, how did they get to Tennessee? Well, it turned out it was faked by someone who had read a scholarly book and you made it up. And I think there was also a case um, in Brazil, probably very likely just forged inscriptions in the modern time to, to make the case for them crossing the Atlantic. I would say, it, you know, it's possible. People didn't know about the Vikings, but for a long time, but we know, we know they actually had a settlement in Newfoundland in 1000 BC. So I would just say, I wish I knew. I wish we wish we had data. It's not out of the question, but the empirical data is really just for um, sort of the Atlantic coast of Africa, Northwest Africa, and the um, coast of Spain and Portugal so far. Great, thank you. And a few questions on climate. Uh, David Haskell asked, the Levant has been through wide swings in climate from very dry to quite lush. Uh, what were climactic conditions like this, like, like during this Phoenician period and how did that affect their culture and trade? Right. Well, there's a lot of work being done uh, lately on ancient climate change. Um, in, uh, archaeologists collaborating with paleoclimatologists and, and people who, who get evidence for this. Uh, I've been hearing lately about a climate event um, around 1200 BC, uh, which may be related to the Sea People's movements. I mean, it's, it's hard to know because um, people respond in different ways to drought or a change in weather patterns, uh, such as we know happened in the past. Uh, there's a major event in 2200 BC that a lot of people talked about and there's some real social and political changes. There's the eruption of the volcano of Santorini of the Thera eruption in the island of Santorini, Santorini the Greek islands, like blew the whole center out of the Island is one of the largest uh, volcanic eruptions ever in human history. That probably had a major impact on the whole Mediterranean with you know, a few years of, like I say, no summer is cold and the ash clouds in the air and also the uh, tsunami waves um, through the Mediterranean. Uh, so some people look at that, and, but that would be a more of a short-term climate effect. And then, as I say, around 1200, I'm hearing that there's more evidence for perhaps another drought happening. Whether that triggered changes in 
Tyre or in, in the Phoenician world is hard to say, although it does coincide with the withdrawal of the Egyptian empire and the independence of these kingdoms. Sorry, I can't be more specific, but um, the climate, as far as we know, is basically the same now as it was then. But there were periods of, of drought that affected things. Thank you. And uh, some questions on ancient DNA you'll probably find interesting. Has there been any DNA analysis um, on Phoenicians that relate them to modern Arabs, if any? Well, I'm not entirely up on the Phoenicians. I, the problem with Phoenicians is they cremated their dead. And cremation does not help with the preservation of DNA. Uh, so there's there's been recent DNA work done on Bronze Age Canaanites, uh, you know, showing their affinities and and their ancestral movements a little bit. But um, that I simply don't know, not having uh, specifically studied Phoenician uh, DNA. And uh, Boyd Tuttle asks, is Tel Kason a fully man-made structure or is it a natural geological yeah. formation? So, Tel in ancient times when Tel Kason was founded, it was actually pretty close to the Mediterranean Sea. So there's this huge Bay of Haifa, which is all later silting up. Uh, so the highway there that runs from Haifa to Akko is, you know, that, that was open water. So there were these marshy lagoons, we think, and uh, maybe even uh, a way to take a boat right up to the base of the Tel, which was probably on a kind of, we think, on a rocky, a slight rocky hill, like raised up a bit and therefore chosen for settlement. But Tel Kesan is 25 meters tall, and the vast majority of that is human, artificially made. It's basically the remnants of the mud bricks of the many, many houses over the, well, over 3,000 year period that built it up. That's what I mean by a tell, that it's largely artificial, but in this case probably had a little rocky outcrop that was built on. And what percentage of those layers have you, uh, <laughs> have you sort of gone to at this point? Well, we've just scratched the surface. I mean, there was a previous dig there and um, there, you know, the earlier Bronze Age materials are buried very deeply. This summer, we're gonna to try to come in from the side and cut a trench down the slope to get a window into earlier periods. But as Andrew knows, who was there in 2019, you know, we're down maybe a meter in some places and, and really just in the top couple of strata. And there are many, many more below that. So it's a research, so archeologists have to choose what is our research goal? How do we dig? How deeply do we go here versus there? And um, in my case, I'm more interested in this narrow period of time from 1200 to 600. And so we won't go very deep. Someone else will come and to do more there in the future. Great, and a few questions on the Phoenician language and alphabet. I'll try to summarize them, a couple of them. One was um, on uh, uh, Jonathan Honegas, why didn't they use clay tablets? There's also a question on, you know, how did, uh, how are vowels inferred for consonant only words? Like, can we, can we even know what real Phoenician would have sounded like? And then um, uh, Bukit Sahin asks, could you speak to any Luwian languages in your research? And I have no idea what that yeah, means. In case you do <laughs> answer any of these questions as you, oh, as you I'll, I'll try to just say briefly about the questions. So the cuneiform script is based on shoving a reed stylus with a, you know, a flat point into the soft clay and making these wedge marks. Cuneiform means uh, wedge shaped. Cuneus is Latin for wedge or nail. So they stick them in in these little patterns, but um, the Phoenician script was borrowed from the Egyptian hieroglyphs, this pictographic writing, which is more like ink or paint, you know, and it's a kind of, it's a linear script. And so tablets, ever, ever write, try to write, you know, in script or, you know, with smooth flowing lines in clay, it just doesn't work the way that it works when you just shove, quickly shove a style. So the very nature of the script doesn't, work very well for clay tablets, besides which in the areas they lived, clay was not as abundant or as in Iraq, you know, where they had no paper, they had no trees, they had clay. Over on the Phoenician coast, they had a, a easy access to papyrus from Egypt. And some of our early Egyptian document texts tell us about, you know, a ship with 500 big rolls of papyrus to be, you know, exchanged at a Phoenician port. So we know they're using papyrus, which is made from the um, 
papyrus plant, like this reedy water plant in, in the marshes of Egypt. Uh, into, you know, our word paper comes from papyrus. Um, so that's what they used. And it was just so much faster and more efficient for them and quite durable for what they didn't realize that 3000 years later, people like us wanted to know what they wrote, you know, ink on papyrus, uh, ink on paper, just like we do. And then the point about uh, the consonants, well, I don't wanna get too much detail, but the structure of Semitic languages is based on these consonantal roots like MLK, Mem Lamakaf means ruling or king, or it has the idea of, of kingship. And so then you have different vowel patterns tell you whether it's a noun or a verb or whatever. Uh, and anybody who really is fluent in that language, like in modern Arabic and Hebrew, you could just leave out the vowels because you know from context, you know, what word it's supposed to be. And then the consonants tell you. And so you just sort of automatically fill it in. We reconstruct Phoenician vowels from a combination of knowing the Hebrew vowels, which were then notated much later with these vowel points, and from Greek transcriptions of Phoenician words where the Greeks wrote in Greek letters, the sound of the Phoenician word with their vowels. So there's a, there's a whole scholarly field for reconstructing the vowel systems and the grammar of these languages. Luwian, you know, that was used in this period, I have a site in Turkey where they, they use Luwian. Uh, Luwian is a hieroglyphic script, but it's not alphabetic. It's, it's a, it, it, didn't, it didn't catch up. It, it's, a, it's a Turkish, it's merged in Turkey, but it's a kind of hieroglyphic script. Okay, I hope that covers those questions. Yeah, you covered it all. That's great. And uh, I think we'll end on this question. Paul Mills asked, uh, do you recommend any, any authors in the classics? I think he's meaning... Uh, any any of the classic authors that you know have anything to say about the Phoenicians? Anything that would be worth reading? Yeah, for... Well, I mean, obviously Herodotus is the great historian, and uh, if you read his histories, um, you know, there's all sorts of. The question is whether to how much of it is true. <laughs> you know, he heard stories from everybody, wrote them down, and you know, he's the first great historian, I suppose. But um, there's a long history of scholarship trying to figure out which parts of Herodotus are accurate and not. But that's a good place to start just for um, if you're interested in, in reading ancient Greek authors. There's a lot of great translations of Herodotus, like the Penguin, Penguin translation. Uh, beyond that, um, for, for Phoenicians in general, there's a, a great new uh, encyclopedia uh, edited by my friend and colleague, Carolina Lopez Ruiz, and it's the Oxford Companion to the Phoenician and Punic Mediterranean. And it's more scholarly, but it, it would cite all sorts of sources, um, Greek sources as well. Great, and uh, I, I thank you for that. And I, I do see uh, many people saying, it's too bad you can't hear our applause. And um, right. someone asked, are you accepting volunteers for the site in Malaga? And uh, interest in Tel Quezon as well. So I think there's yeah. some So stay tuned. Um, you know, I don't have a website for Malaga, and we're not able to take volunteers this year. If we do go, we hope to start this year with a smaller group. But in future years, uh, we want to make it a full scale field school with, with students and volunteers. So you can always take my email address and maybe email me next year at this time and see what's happening in Spain. And as I said, we're pretty set on having a dig in Talkesan in Israel for one month every August, starting this year, you know, four years running. And if you can't go this year, you might want to go next year and, and just get your name on the list. Um, and you can see the details of that dig on the website and the cost and all the other factors. But do, do realize, I think all of you do, it is really hard physical labor and hot and dirty but it's fun and you never know what you're going to find well, thank you david that's from a true explorer i really appreciate your presentation and, and your patience in answering these questions um just for everyone on the call there is a uh, another lecture uh, next week um i think it happens to be on valentine's day so if you don't have plans or if you do have plans make them with us um, we have a, uh, a lecture, How to Mend a Broken Heart, with Drs. Roger Hartle, uh, Yoshifumi Naka, and Syed Amjad Hussein. That's next Monday at 7 p.m. Um, hope to see you there. And I believe that there is an option to be in person at the Explorers Club on 70th Street. 
Again, thank you, David, uh, for your time and really appreciate everyone yeah. asking such great questions. Thank you. Well, so and much. great to be with you virtually uh, and invisibly, but great to, great to be with you, if not to see you all. Take care. Thank you.